Well, thanks everybody for coming. I'm hopeful we can have a good interactive hour here. Uh, I, uh, I've been working in this area. I'll give you a little autobiography of how I got interested. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, ways in which I think references to the Holocaust in current debates get misused and are not uh, used appropriately. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about research ethics issues that uh, are raised by what happened in the concentration camps in terms of uh, the research that was conducted on people in those camps, and then address a pretty difficult question, which is, so what did the uh, people argue in their defense uh, doing these experiments? And part of the reason that I'm going to uh, do the latter is some of you know that there are noises being made about holding uh, the Russians accountable for war crimes in the Ukraine. And there are people who sometimes draw analogies to uh, the Nazi uh, behaviors, German behaviors during World War II. Um, and I think some of that may have some application, but some of it poses challenges to uh, holding, say, Russia, Russian leadership, the Russian armed services, the Wagner private mercenary group, whoever it is, accountable for what's going on as they invade the uh, uh, Ukraine. So that'll be a place where I think uh, metaphors may work, but there may be some lessons learned from what took place at the Nuremberg trials at the end of the uh, war. So why have we had such a hard time coming to terms with medicine and science's role in the Holocaust? And one way we've had a hard time coming to terms is it's very often that people in having debates today about COVID, vaccine mandates, euthanasia, medical assistance in dying, which 10 states have legalized in areas involving uh, research in prisons, that people will quickly invoke the Holocaust or Nazis or both and say, well, you can't allow medical insistence in dying for the terminally ill, you're going to go down a slippery slope and wind up where the Nazis did. Remember, that's how they started out their campaigns of murder. They began with people with disabilities, people they thought were uh, too expensive to keep alive in institutions, draining public resources people who were inclined to crime or prostitution or antisocial behavior. And they said, we've got to get rid of them. Their burden to the state is too great. And many people would say, when people talk today about letting a terminally ill person with cancer uh, be helped to die by their doctor, it's partly due to the perception that they're too hard to take care of for their families too expensive to take care of for the state. And so just as Germany took a path from, uh, if you will, murder of what they called quote unquote useless eaters to uh, uh, race elimination and ethnic elimination of Jews and gypsies and Slavs, um, we would be doing the same. And as people say, well, you know, we have mandates today for vaccines but that's the state making us do things uh, with their state power. That's like the Nazis uh, insisting on people uh, getting uh, wearing gold stars and identifying themselves as Jews when they're out in public. That's why some anti-vaccine resistors put on gold stars and uh, said, you're treating us just like uh, the Germans treated the Jews you're making us get vaccinated, you're discriminating against us, you're firing us from our jobs, you won't let us go in public places unless we can prove we're vaccinated or masked or both. And that is exactly analogous, they some maintained, to the kinds of restrictions that the Germans put on Jews in terms of where they could go, where they could work, and so on. Well, I think those metaphors don't work because I don't think they capture the key element of what was going on 
in Germany, and that was not just state power and authority, but also an incredible view of racism that took over German medicine and science before the Nazis came to power, but it was something that the Nazis adopted. So after Charles Darwin wrote his Origin of Species book, many people took his metaphors about how nature evolved and the idea that there was natural selection driving the weak out and the more reproductively fit would gain advantage and take over different environments. Many people applied those biological views to social theories and economics. Thinkers in uh, England, in America, in Germany, in many places, took up a movement that was called social Darwinism. And they began to say, look, um, what is true in nature is also true in human society. The weak have to get out of the way uh, of the uh, powerful. Um, it is natural that we get rid of threats to our uh, species identity, or in the case of German uh, biology, they begin to talk a lot about the health of the German people or the Volk, the German word for people, and basically say we've got to eliminate threats to the integrity of our species, otherwise other groups and species will replace us. And so uh, you do find a kind of, uh, I think, dishonest or twisted view of Darwinism and natural selection coming through the biology justifying things like racial superiority, that whites should have colonies in Africa and other parts of the world because they were superior. And it's natural that the uh, smarter or the better displace the poorer and the weaker um, and the less able. Um, of course, whether uh, any particular Western group was more able or powerful or naturally imbued with skills than other people, even uh, in Asia or Africa or South America, uh, was partly a question of, uh, you know, disease, history, many, many, many factors. Um, the 20th century Europeans tended to look back to their uh, origins in ancient Greece, in Rome, and say that was the connection for their civilizations, which of course wasn't true. The uh, people that were uh, in Germany and England and other countries advocating social Darwinism were more descended from what the Romans viewed as barbarians <laughs> and would not have included them as their uh, descendants, if you will, uh, when they uh, uh, made these claims about uh, connections to the primacy of Western civilization. Um, but let's take a look at some of the events that took place in Germany who did them, and you'll start to understand why it's easy, I think, to invoke the Holocaust, invoke Nazis in current debates, because people don't really understand what was going on uh, in those uh, times when the uh, Nazis were engaged in mass murder and horrendous research. So may interrupt you. Uh, you should be able to share your screen now. I've, I've adjusted some settings and um, right, let me try it to show your PowerPoint. Let's see what we can do here. Get that on. Any see anything? Not yet. Uh, not yet. All right. Bear with me one more second. Anything now? Um, no. <laughs> well, I'm sorry. Uh, about that. Still no? Uh, no. All right. Well, we tried. My apologies. It's all right. Um, let's see if I can uh, go back to where I was. <laughs> 
Bear with me one second here. Got to reset myself a little bit. So what I started to say is, why have we gotten this so wrong? Why is it hard to get straight? What's going on in Germany? And there are a couple of reasons why we lose track of what the Germans were thinking and doing and what motivated them to commit terrible crimes um, in the name of uh, Nazi ideology. One was, it was very difficult for people to believe that a country that was at the forefront of science and medicine, as Germany was prior to World War II, it was the leading scientific and medical nation of the world in terms of best education, best won the most Nobel prizes, this sort of thing. And also was a place that was viewed as the home to high culture and music and the arts uh, uh, could wind up committing terrible crimes. How could they do it? Uh, people had expectations that a, a highly civilized society of Germany and Austria, by the way, too, uh, would not just slide off into uh, mass murder and racism and uh, abuse of uh, concentration camp uh, inmates for research and ultimately death. So one way they explained it was to say, well, it must have been a bunch of kooks and crackpots and nuts. People must have taken over the regime, crazy people like Adolf Hitler, or in the concentration camps, crazy doctors like Mengele. Some of you know Joseph Mengele has become sort of a poster child for German doctors in World War II. Um, you may have seen this movie and different stories about how the Israelis went after and caught Mengele, who had escaped to uh, Argentina and brought him and other war criminals, by the way, back to uh, um, trial in Israel. But Mengele was not representative of the people who were involved in uh, the Nazi party as doctors and scientists or running the concentration camps, which doctors and scientists did, um, he was an outlier. When people uh, wanted to know if uh, um, somebody was going to be involved in research at a camp, if you were going to do a study that involved something that the German military was interested in, and very concerned to get the results about. You didn't bring in a kind of fringe kook like Dr. Mengele. You brought in mainstream scientists, mainstream doctors to carry out the experiments. The people that were involved in advising Hitler and his political groups on race elimination and race hygiene uh, up to the time they came to power and thereafter were major leaders from the German medical and scientific establishment, not Dr. Mengele, who never held such roles. And they were early converts to the Nazi party. They really believed in this uh, view that uh, natural selection led to German superiority, that the lessons of Darwinism were that Germany had to get rid of everybody who wasn't of the same ethnic or racial type. Otherwise, they would suffer a kind of eugenic collapse. They were fervent believers, but they also were the main teachers at universities. They were the people who ran key hospitals. It wasn't a group of crazy people who took over Germany and got into power somehow. That's a convenient story if you're trying to explain away who was it that was involved. It's easier to say, oh, it's nuts and kooks rather than the mainstream, but indeed it was the mainstream. It was also the case at the end of World War II that the Germans needed to restore medicine and science in a broken country. We had defeated Germany, we had bombed major cities to dust, we had left the population full of refugees, the Russians coming or Soviet army coming in the other direction was laying waste to Eastern Germany. That country was a mess. We needed to prop that country back up because we were going to use Germany as a buffer against the Soviet Union in the Cold War. And we didn't really want to run around talking about Nazis and former Nazis and people who were holding high positions in the Nazi government because we wanted to use Germany, as I say, as a buffer against Soviet power. And so we kind of let Nazis go back into power. 
And some of them were brought here to run our rocket programs and some of our weapons programs. Um, uh, Werner von Braun, to give a name you might have heard of, who helped invent the uh, rockets that were used to attack London, became a major figure in the American space program and indeed in the American uh, rocket program and has facilities named after him in uh, Alabama to this day, even though he was uh, probably uh, the person most responsible for killing uh, civilians in uh, Britain more than anybody else. But we needed him, or it was felt that we needed him and others, as I say, to protect against Russian expansion. Germany wanted to restore these scientists and doctors to their roles, even if they were Nazis and had done horrible things, because they needed to have a healthcare system and they wanted to have science. And so they ignored or whitewashed a lot of the uh, things that people had done during the war in order to reopen the hospitals, in order to reopen the clinics, in order to reopen the research institutes. And so basically what I'm saying is it's been hard to come to grips with the fact that mainstream doctors and scientists supplied a racist ideology that the Nazis picked up on and used to justify uh, killing uh, both the disabled and the uh, elderly, uh, the demented, and then eventually uh, people of other ethnic and racial groups and when the war ended, there were a lot of reasons why people who had done that, who were in the mainstream of science and medicine, went back to work and resumed their lives. Um, the Cold War being one, the need to have these people return because they knew how to run the healthcare system and the pharmacies and be the nurses and do all the rest of the things that a broken nation needed to have. So that's really my explanation for uh, what went on. So let's, taking that as a reason why it's been hard to come to grips with uh, what happened and why it happened, let's see, if you will, what did happen just in one area, the uh, camps. Some of you know that there was a trial at the end of World War II, 1947, the so-called Nuremberg trial. The defendants who went on trial, the first group were called the doctor's trial. It was 21 doctors and public health people, again, all mainstream doctors and officials who were not Mengele and fringe, but very mainstream people. And they were put on trial for crimes that they had committed in the concentration camps. The reason they went first was it was not clear how to punish people uh, who had been involved in things like mass murder at a camp because it wasn't clear who was actually responsible for turning on the gas or bringing the people to the camp and so on. But when you had research barbarity, when people were put in terrible experiments to learn things uh, in the camps, there were witnesses, some people survived. And so the prosecution decided that they would put the doctors on trial because they had better evidence to go after them initially for their crimes. And then they would move on to the issue about what they term for the first time, crimes against humanity. This will be a problem by the way, and is an appropriate use of the metaphor in this Russian Ukraine situation where people wanna put the Russians on trial for crimes against humanity. Sometimes it's hard to know who did what to whom without witnesses and so on. Some of you may know that the Ukrainians are very busy trying to document abuses, situations where people were tortured, civilians raped, people bombed who were in a hospital, children killed. They're trying to collect all this information because again, that's the way you can win in a courtroom. If you simply say Putin invaded Russia, and terrible things happened, it's hard to go to trial just as it was in Nuremberg and prosecute anybody but Putin because you don't have connections to what people actually did. So there were better connections from these terrible research projects, by the way, I'm gonna tell you about some of them just in case you've forgotten or don't know. So in the camps, the Germans studied things like, um, how was it possible to best treat burns. 
The reason they were interested in that and burn people deliberately and horribly was people were getting, their soldiers were getting terribly burned uh, in the war and they wanted to come up with better treatments. So the military had a keen interest in burn treatments. They treated wounds. They would deliberately injure people in the camps and then try to figure out again how best to treat them. And again, for obvious reasons, their service people in the Luftwaffe and the Wehrmacht and other branches of the German armed forces were getting wounded. So they wanted to get answers. They were keenly interested in trying to figure out how to make seawater drinkable because many of their pilots and people who were staffing the Navy wound up in places where they didn't have water and they wanted to see if they could come up with ways to quickly make seawater drinkable. They did terrible experiments, basically poisoning many, many people in the camps trying to learn how to do this. They never figured it out. But again, the military was behind those studies. Some of you know the Germans had jets and they were ahead of us and were developing jet fighters faster than we were. They were trying to study what would happen if you had decompression in a jet uh, at a high altitude trying to save their pilots. And so they did those experiments and killed many, many people, decompressing them in artificial uh, chambers where they could uh, bring about decompression suddenly, killed lots of people, never figured out uh, how to handle that. A lot of German uh, soldiers were fighting in freezing climates like Russia or the uh, North Sea. And so one of the things the military was keenly interested in was exposure to cold water, hypothermia due to exposure to the cold. Here, uh, they did come up with some results and it will be familiar to you. Prior to World War II, most life preservers were life belts. If you ever get a chance to go to the Titanic exhibit, you'll see that the life belts they used on that boat, and they didn't have enough of them, but the ones they had went around your waist and had little buoys on them. And that's what kept you afloat if you felt it fell into the ocean. The Germans learned that if you kept the head and the brain out of the water, you would live longer and it would be more effective. So the horse collar shape of life preservers was something they did perfect during the war. It was done in studies where many people again died in the camps to establish uh, the validity of this design. But every time on a boat or an airplane, we see that horse collar design. I can tell you that comes from Nazi medical research in the concentration camps. That was one of the things they did discover. Well, the point of all these studies is that very uh, remarkably competent and strong scientists were involved in every one of those studies. When Dr. Mengele was off doing whatever crazy experiments he decided to do that nobody cared about in the camps, the military would bring in very competent doctors and scientists, do these studies aimed at the war effort. And that is uh, why I am absolutely certain that mainstream people were doing terrible things in the camps. And this came out again during the Nuremberg trials that uh, the people who had been involved in many of these studies were top flight scientists, top flight public health people, top flight uh, medical administrators, and so on. So here's a question that comes up if you look at this area. What did they say in their own defense? And this becomes relevant to thinking about when is it appropriate to say what's going on today might lead to abuses of the sort that the Nazis engaged in? Or uh, are we uh, doing things today that are just like things that the uh, Nazis did? So the ethical arguments of the German researchers when they were put on trial for these bad experiments in the camps it's not um, the same sort of thing as you might expect um, if you were looking at trials of people who had, you know, bombed London or uh, engaged in uh, illegal invasions of France and Belgium and the Netherlands during the war and uh, Italy and, excuse me, uh, Greece and uh, Yugoslavia and other things. Those trials came later. These trials are specifically the first set, the doctor's trials, were about the crimes that I just outlined to you in the experiments that people did in the camps. 
And people might have thought, well, the people would go to court, defend themselves and just say they were made to do it or forced to do it. That isn't what happened. What they said was a variety of uh, things in their own defense. They said what they did was right and ethical and tried to explain it to the judges. So here were the arguments. You can find these if you pull out the transcripts from the Nuremberg trials. They'll be around in libraries. Uh, you can look at them. They're online, as a matter of fact, too, now. The Nuremberg trial transcripts, look at the doctor's trial, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So one thing they said was, look, these people are genetically not like us. They are subhuman. You can do to them what you want because they are not really people. They're not human beings. They don't have rights. That becomes very important because if somebody says today, if you make me vaccinate, you're treating me like the Jews or the gypsies or others that were uh, persecuted by the Germans and put into terrible concentration camps and even experimented on, that analogy doesn't hold. Nobody is vaccinating anyone because they're subhuman or think of them as less than human or think of them as somehow different and uh, not even in the same category as a human being. Whatever's going on when people mount vaccination campaigns or tell somebody they have to wear a mask today, it's to try and protect them. It's to treat them exactly as a human being and sometimes to use them to protect other human beings. I'm not saying that makes it right. And there may be reasons not to have mandatory vaccination or not to have mandatory masking. But one of the reasons it's just not a good idea to invoke the Nazis when someone has something done to them that they don't like is that the Nazi argument is that there were really two kinds of beings. There were the human beings who were the Aryan German peoples, and there were the subhuman people. And the subhuman people were like animals, and you could do what you wanted to them without worrying about it. That makes the invocation of the Nazi uh, metaphor or analogy in most of today's debates inappropriate. It's just not the same kind of consideration that led uh, the Germans to do certain things as are leading public health people in America or Europe or other parts of the world to do certain things to fight a pandemic. Whatever the problems are of Anthony Fauci, he wasn't trying to uh, get anybody to wear a mask or uh, get themselves vaccinated or get boosters because he thought of them as subhuman or had some sort of eugenic racial theory in mind. That's what the Germans did. It's not what was going on today or recently. Another argument is they could do what they wanted to people in the camps because they were prisoners and criminals. So basically at the trial, they said, look, they're uh, locked up because they're criminals. Criminals don't have rights and we can experiment on them because uh, they forfeited their rights because they're criminals. Well, again, this argument doesn't make a lot of sense because the only thing most of these people were guilty of when they were put into these concentration camps was being a member of a racial group, an ethnic group. There were a lot of Poles and Russians in these camps and they were there for uh, being prisoners of war from the wrong ethnic group. There were also people there who were there for their political beliefs. There were Jehovah's Witnesses in those camps. There were people who were gay and in those camps. So. Being a criminal, quote unquote, yes, according to the Nazi regime, they were criminals. But in fact, it's hard to argue that that word has any real application uh, to people who were rounded up and thrown into these horrible conditions, and then many of whom were experimented upon. Again, if you're thinking about a current event and somebody's saying, well, that's what the Nazis did, or that's just like what the Nazis do. I don't think any of the uh, arguments about why we might want to have medically assisted suicide by doctor for terminally ill people who request help in dying, who want to take a lethal dose of medicine and administer it to themselves if the doctor prescribes it, that's got nothing to do with getting rid of them because they're prisoners or somehow criminals. Again, you've got to look at what the Germans said at the trials in defense of what they did, it's not just uh, seeing that the Germans had euthanasia, and some people think that if you help someone to die, die today, it's euthanasia. You have to look at the underlying 
rationale and the underlying rationale for Germans at Nuremberg trial and the underlying rationale for arguments today about medically assisted dying or uh, helping people with terminal illness hasten their death. It's their own volition, their own choice to do that today, but it has nothing to do with criminality or being a prisoner of anything. Another argument that was made was that, well, look, we can study these people and we will make great gains, uh, uh, a knowledge, maybe save more lives overall if we deliberately freeze them to death and learn how to make better life preservers, if we study wounds and injuries and then come up with better treatments for them. So the argument that was made also was that it was worth it to sacrifice some people if you could get a big benefit for many other people. So that's why we're gonna treat these people in these camps as just guinea pigs and just do whatever we want to them and even kill them if they die in these experiments because it will be a risk benefit trade-off that's worth it. Well, again, somebody wants to argue today about uh, whether or not we should try to do research on uh, COVID uh, viruses. And we have a big debate running today, as you know, about uh, what was the origin of COVID? Did it come out of a medical experiment or a science experiment gone wrong in a Wuhan laboratory in China? Was it bats or some other animals who somehow spread it to us through breathing on those animals or them breathing on us or eating them? And we got the viruses that they carried that became COVID in us. Well, there's certainly plenty to argue about, about where COVID started. There are plenty of things to argue about, about who's doing dangerous research in labs, but no one is making the argument that, yeah, we do do dangerous research uh, to save lots of lives. Um, and that's uh, why COVID originated, because we picked that, because we thought if we uh, fooled around with COVID vaccine uh, viruses, we'd really benefit a lot of people. People might have thought if we fooled around with COVID uh, viruses, we might learn a lot about that category of virus, but no one thought at the time pre-COVID pandemic that COVID was one of the major threats to our health and our public health. People were interested in SARS, they were interested in MERS, they were interested in the flu, avian flu, many other Zika, but COVID was way down the list. Whoever was studying it, I didn't really think, oh, if I understand this virus better, I'm really going to benefit lots of people all over the world. The pandemic, if you will, took us by surprise. So again, to repeat, the Germans did what they did, not because they were made to do it, not because they had some force or power that they couldn't resist uh, at peril to their own lives. Most of the people who did this research that was so horrible and killed so many people in the camps did it because they had moral arguments that they thought made sense. People were there because they were subhuman. Well, if you're gonna make an analogy to what was going on in Germany by invoking the Holocaust or talking about feeling that some group today is being abused or uh, mistreated, it's usually almost always not because somebody thinks they're subhuman or that they're like animals and they don't count. Similarly, arguments that we can do what we want in the camps because they're prisoners and criminals. I don't think that was accurate for that time. They were not really criminals, um, but they uh, certainly, we have the view today, whether it's public health or uh, different debates we have about end of life care or even abortion, we're not viewing anyone as a prisoner or a criminal in order to justify what we're talking about. So that analogy doesn't make any sense either. It doesn't make what we're doing today right, but it doesn't make it right to turn back and say, ah, that's what the Nazis did. They didn't care about the value of human life. They killed people. So we're going to permit abortion because we don't care about the value of human life. Their views were very strongly connected to they're not human and they're criminals. Very different kind of a framework for thinking. And then, as I said, sometimes this cost-benefit utility argument comes into play, but 
that isn't really uh, so relevant to what's going on when we have a lot of debates, contemporary debates today. I think the uh, other uh, important uh, thing to remember about uh, some of these uh, German ethical arguments is that they're hard to look at, they're difficult to uh, discuss because we don't like to think that Nazis have ethics. We like to believe that, you know, they just have been amoral or immoral people. But I'm going to tell you, if you read those trial transcripts, it's pretty clear that part of the reason you could go to a camp and do terrible experiments is that you thought it was the right thing to do, that you were ethically uh, okay with doing what you were doing in the camps. It would have been very difficult to carry out these things day after day for mainstream people, scientists and doctors who were sophisticated, who had families, who went home and listened to uh, music and often had wonderful art in their homes and were very sophisticated cultured people to do these barbaric experiments. You had to believe that there was an ethical argument in favor of doing them. So as hard as it is even for me to acknowledge, I think there is such a thing as Nazi or if you will, German wartime, World War II ethics. I think the ethical arguments are wrong. I think they're flawed. I think they're inaccurate. Some of you may know that the first principle of the Nuremberg trial, when the judges issued a opinion, was that these arguments are not acceptable. And what is true is that any human being will count as a moral agent and that to put them in experiments, you have to have their permission, you have to have their voluntary choice, you have to have their consent. That Nuremberg decision became the Helsinki Code of Ethics, which has been revised a few times, but it's the basic World Medical Association guideline on how to do experiments on uh, any human subject or participant today. And the first principle of that code is that the informed consent of the subject is absolutely essential. At the trial and in the codes, what was happening was they were trying to take on the German ethical arguments and say they're wrong. You can't just kill some people and in order to benefit a lot of people. Those some people, in order to be in experiments, dangerous experiments, have to give their permission. You can't just draft them in. Everybody has the right to pick and choose whether they want to be in a study, even prisoners, even criminals. That's why today, even in the U.S., it's hard to do studies in jails and prisons because of the precedent that we don't want to just take away everybody's right to give permission to be or not be in a medical experiment just because they're in jail. I'm not saying you can't ever get into a jail or a prison to do research, but it's very hard and it should be very hard because the tendency is to treat those people as if they have no rights whatsoever and you can do anything you want to them. And that is precisely what the judges at Nuremberg rejected, precisely what the code of ethics that we operate with today in research affirms, that you must have choice. And obviously the argument about being subhuman or that everybody who's not of the right ethnic group or racial group or political view or gender orientation, again, has no rights because they're animals. Um, that is not accepted by the uh, judges at Nuremberg either. They basically create a human rights framework that acknowledges the dignity and essential humanity of everybody regardless. So. It's no accident that the uh, Nuremberg judges and later those who transformed that into the Helsinki Code of Ethics wrote the first principle being you have to get the permission of your subject because they knew about the German ethical arguments. They heard them at the trial and they wanted to refute them. That's where the emphasis on autonomy, on choice, on personal human dignity comes from, it didn't come flying out of the air. It was listening to the German ethical arguments and saying they're flawed, they're wrong, we can't accept them. But that is so important to acknowledge because again, when you see people today casually invoking uh, 
Nazis or the Holocaust in some political argument or some debate, it diminishes the power of what uh, the judges at Nuremberg did, what the power of the ethical code is in taking on these terrible racist uh, arguments, these uh, subhuman arguments, these marginalized arguments that the Germans tried to advance. We don't want to lose sight of uh, that, uh, those moral mistakes and attempts to remedy them in just being cavalier about uh, situations where uh, people do something we don't like and we're pretty quick to say, oh, well, then that's like what the Nazis did or you must be a Nazi or uh, you're gonna slide into Nazism if you keep doing that. Again, I'm not trying to defend any particular choice, behavior, or policy of today. We can argue about abortion. We can argue about medically assisted suicide or dying. We can argue about vaccine mandates. We can argue about many things, but we should not be invoking the Nazi uh, era because the reasons they had for doing what they did were very different from the reasons that people today might have for doing what they want to do. In the case of assisted suicide, people are arguing they ought to get to do it because they should be given choice and freedom to do what they want. You hear that argument too from many who want to defend or be pro-choice about abortion. You hear many other people saying in the pro-life side, but they're people and we have to respect the humanity of every uh, human being from conception to death. And uh, that's a very important principle to stand on. That's not a principle that the Nazis were standing on. <laughs> they completely rejected that on racial, ethnic and political grounds. That's why they didn't uh, agree. So I'm gonna uh, bring my uh, talk to an end by just pointing out when we hear about crimes against humanity today and potential trials for war crimes of people who are leading Russia and in the armed forces and committing barbaric and terrible acts on the Ukrainians, and I am firmly on the Ukrainian side here, I think they're being unjustly invaded and I think there are war crimes. And I think uh, Russia is basically trying to bleed Ukraine uh, dry and get them to submit by a campaign of terror. It is important to point out <clears throat> that you've got to have evidence. You need to have eyewitnesses. It's very important to be able to muster evidence. It's hard to win war crimes trials against anybody unless somebody can say, I was there and he did that to her. I was there and I saw these 10 people shot. I was there and I saw or took testimony that these women had been raped. It is crucial that you preserve the evidence that you have the connections to horrible behavior. Again, that's why the doctor's trial was the first one after the war. They had witnesses, they could link different scientists and doctors to terrible experiments. They had uh, evidence, and so the prosecution said, let's go there first. That's the e easiest way to get these trials going because we can make the links to actual people who did horrible things. That's why it is so important to do what the Ukrainians are trying to do and support that, which is to document, to film, to get eyewitness testimony, to do what General Eisenhower did when he got to the camps during World War II, which is to immediately say, I want photographers everywhere. I want this documented because someday people will say this was too horrible to have happened. I want it all recorded. He knew that that was uh, crucial is maintaining that evidentiary link and uh, compiling the evidence. It's important uh, that we know that that's gonna come up, I'm sure, uh, when finally and hopefully Russia is called to account for their crimes that they're committing in the Ukraine. And I would say this is true of the Rwandan genocide or wherever people want to al uh, allege or claim that uh, human rights crimes are being committed. Whoever it is, you've got to have evidence. That's another lesson that we can draw out of the Holocaust. It's an appropriate one. It's difficult for the legal system to just have general charges even when millions die because you don't know exactly who pulled the trigger, who dropped the bomb, who gave the order, who carried out the order, who shot whom, uh, 
that's all becomes very murky. What you need to have is specific people with specific violations or witnessing terrible things directly that can then be drawn into a courtroom. So watch for that as we see efforts to uh, prosecute, hopefully, uh, what's going on now. Uh, that starts with <clears throat> the understanding of what it took to put the doctors on trial first at Nuremberg. So let me stop here, leave a few minutes for questions or comments. Uh, happy to answer anything that might be out there. Thank you, Dr. Kaplan. Um, I definitely have uh, learned some things and I, I do believe I'll be able to take <clears throat> some of the information that you've shared and apply it to the, what we talk about at the museum, which is uh, every once in a while, we have groups coming in that are interested in the ethical use of the data that was being collected in, in the concentration camp. So we have uh, Betsy here, who's a member of the, our Terre Haute community. And she's asking, is it ethical to use the data from the Nazi experiments? Well, as you might imagine, that's something I've had to think about. <laughs> um, I didn't give you the biographical part of the story here, but my family, I'm, I'm Jewish, but I, I'm not somebody who lost a lot of relatives there. My family had moved to the United States in the 1860s, very early, and I didn't lose a lot of relatives there. But my dad was in World War II. And he was there in Europe for five years. And he was one of the uh, soldiers who liberated the Dachau concentration camp where some of the experiments on freezing were done that I just told you about. So when he came home, he didn't talk about what he saw for a long time, probably maybe well into his 60s before he started to talk to me about what he had seen. So using data, and saying something valuable came out of this was also personal for me because I had to talk about it with my dad who said, these are horrible crimes. You don't know what these camps were like. You can't be serious that you're gonna even think about using the data. So he was one potential critic. Another critic, I did interview and talk with many survivors of the camps, a few of whom had been in experiments and got their views. And I will tell you roughly 70% said, if you could really save a life, it was if you could do something really important with whatever they learned, use it. But not all. It was definitely a minority who said no. And then I think I've come to understand, too, that a lot of things we do know in medicine outside of the concentration camp experiments, they come from some pretty terrible experiments that were done on people. Surgery, pioneering surgery on women was done on slaves without anesthesia, some horrible things. Animal experimentation, terrible things were done to animals. They didn't think they could think or feel in the 18th century and did horrible things there. Many horrible experiments on prisoners and orphanages. Some will know the Tuskegee study where we didn't treat African-American people when we had a treatment for venereal disease. So it's not unique to this Holocaust situation? My answer has been yes, I think we should use the data, but with conditions. One, it has to be for an important purpose, not just curiosity, not just to make a better perfume. If you could save a life, a life preserver is an example, then that's a high stakes use. Second, I think we should always have to explain how the data was generated. So you can't use it unless you're willing to say, this was done in the camps, done by people who were ultimately, some of them hung for what they did, killed, punished. Uh, and it was based on uh, terrible uh, behavior fueled by racism and dehumanization of people. You have to put that into your paper. You have to put it into your textbook. You have to explain it. Sadly, that's not always done, but I think that should be a condition. And third, I would never use the names of the scientists. I wouldn't credit them or honor them. You don't want anybody thinking that, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, you know, the data gets used and you get the glory and they don't really care. You sort of use the data and say, this came from hypothermia experiments done in the uh, Dachau concentration camp, 1944. And the findings are being used because there's no other sources. It's high stakes. And that's why we're going to use it. So that was a long windy answer, but yeah, I think if you can meet those conditions, then I would say yes. Thank you. Thank you. We have a, a question here from Anna 
Um, the, first off, do you know about Japan's Unit 731 and do their activities have any redeeming value? I do know about Unit 731. This was a Japanese medical group that conducted horrible experiments about the same time on Chinese and uh, Korean prisoners. Um, there's a difference. The Germans, whatever their flaws, kept very good records. <laughs> and so you could put people at different scenes. And remember, I kept talking about the importance of documenting so that you could hold people to account. That kind of evidence and linkage does not exist for the Unit 731 Medical Experiment Unit of the Japanese Army. They destroyed as much records as they could at the end of the war. It was hard, and there was never a trial. I don't think people felt that there was enough evidence lying around to bring them to trial. They did horrible things, miserable things uh, to their subjects on a par with what the Germans did, but because they didn't have the evidence, because they deliberately destroyed the evidence. Um, and to be honest, because at the time, very few people spoke Japanese well enough to figure out what the hell was going on. Only later did we get some books in writing much later, decades later, about the Japanese experiments. That's what happened. Thank you. We have um, a question here from Angelica and she's asking, uh, how do we decide what what's happening in uh, with Russia and Ukraine? How do we decide what are human rights issues and who is the authority on that? Are there a set of standards already put in place? Well, since the uh, Nuremberg trials, there have been the creation of the International Court at The Hague on human rights. And there is a whole body now of international law that has been established trying to articulate and outline if you will, what is a crime against humanity? What is genocide? Remember when they did this first trial at the end of World War II, they didn't even have that. They didn't even have a definition to agree on on what it was they were gonna try and try people about. So without going on and on about it, yes, there is a body of law. There are internationally recognized courts. We subscribe to them in the US too, to put people on trial for those things. But still they do follow requirements of evidence requirements of firsthand testimony. You can't just show up and say, you know, Art did terrible things to people in his backyard. And I kind of know that because he's not a nice guy. It's still a real legal proceeding. And if you don't have the kind of evidence that we're used to seeing even on TV and courtrooms, you're not going to succeed. It's been very hard to prosecute a lot of people for war crimes because that link isn't there. All right, we have um, a final question here from Brielle, and she's asking, what do you recommend saying to an individual who wants to reference the Holocaust when talking about vaccinations, abortions, or uh, physician-assisted suicides? Yeah. What do you say to those people? That's a great question. So I would say first, gently, I don't think that's the right metaphor because I think what took place in Germany it's very different from what's going on now, particularly because it had so much racism and bigotry fueling what was taking place. There are many things going on today that you may not like or you may not disagree with, but it isn't just the outcome, whether there are a million abortion fetuses killed by abortion or whether it's because somebody's saying you can't keep your job because you won't vaccinate. We can talk about those things. We can argue about those things. They're very important to argue about, but you don't have to bring in an irrelevant um, metaphor from the past. And it's particularly important not to do that because you're not doing justice to the people that were harmed in the past. They got harmed for horrible reasons, terrible reasons, but it's not the same reasons as today. Maybe you'll get somewhere. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Kaplan. Uh, we have hit the one hour mark. Um, for anybody that wants to share this with their friends, it will be available on our website for a short time. Um, you can check that under the programs tab and also keep an eye out on our newsletter as well as our programs tab on the website for upcoming presentations. Again, thank you, Dr. Kaplan. And uh, if you guys have any questions about future events, please email programs at candlesholocaustmuseum.org. And thanks for having me and thanks for having the museum. Yeah, thank you. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>